My name is Amy Starczewski, and I'm the Associate Director of the Oral History Master's Program here at Columbia. Uh, this is part of our year-long lecture series where we present uh, work that's exciting to us in the field of oral history, and we're just so thrilled to have uh, Lillian here to talk with us tonight. So um, I wanted to say that this event was generously co-sponsored by the Center for Oral History, by Insight, and by the Center for the Study of Race and Ethnicity, who uh, especially donated the beautiful flyer for the event that we're all uh, really thrilled with. Um, and so I'm going to turn it over to Mary Marshall Clark, who's going to introduce uh, Lillian, and then we'll get to see a little bit of the film in here. And I'm the director of the Center for Oral History at Columbia. And I am honored to be able to make this presentation in honor of the Paul Lazarsfeld Lecture Series, because when I think of Paul Lazarsfeld and all that he did to help us, he coined the term mass media, fleeing Nazi Austria, and came to the United States and began to talk about the media and all of its complications in a mass culture, and whether or not we could get real information, and how is information being commodified in capitalism and so forth. I don't know anybody more suited to speak in, in honor of Paul Lesserschfeld than Lillian Hernandez. I first met Lillian many, many years ago when we were both young, <laughs> and we were consulting for the Rockefeller Foundation and to, in, the arts, in their arts program, and I was there because they had a lot of oral history applications, and I didn't know how to behave at a place as fancy as the Rockefeller Foundation, and I just bar barely didn't say anything, and Lillian sort of took me under her wing, and. We were sent to Sitka, Alaska together to do a consultation with a young woman who was struggling to understand the, Kling the Klingits in Sitka. And I remember Lillian's character so well because this woman had a lot of problems with her research. And I would have probably said in her approach uh, to indigenous people, and I probably would have said, you know, she's not prepared to do this. Uh, let's just write a report saying we can't suggest funding. And, we, and Lillian said, no, let's teach her. And we took her, and Lily, I listened to Lily and talked to her for four hours and be very honest with her and tell her exactly what her problems were. And she cried, and then she, we gave her cookies, Lily gave her some cookies and some products. And then she rewrote that proposal. And it was such a, in three weeks, and it was such a beautiful proposal. And it just showed me who Lillian is as an educator, as a social reformer, and as a person to help us understand race and ethnicity in the world today. Um, so Lillian has, has conducted media li literacy workshops on Latino stereotypes, self-representation, color, race, power, social relations, and the construction of whiteness. She worked five years with the Center for Puerto Rican Studies at Hunter College on a series of oral histories, and in, in a sense, those oral histories done there are among the best, really, in the city. They chronicle the Puerto Rican community's institution building in New York, she did a beautiful documentary you will see, you will talk about and maybe see portions of tonight on Antonio Pintelha. And I would like to honor Antonio's partner, Mina, who's in the, in the audience. Mina, can you just show who you are? And I was actually there at their marriage. And so I feel very honored to have her in the room bringing on a Tony spirit to, the, to, to our place. And, and I just say Lillian is now working on a new documentary about the Puerto Rican left in New York City. And, you know, I always acknowledge Mina, um, Dr. Pantoja's partner, um, and, and we become friends after Dr. Pantoja passed. Uh, Mina was the extraordinary partner. And I want to say that, you know, you see these great loves um, my aunt and my uncle had this great love, you know, sort of like, oh my God, they loved each other so much. So you talk about these great loves. You know, Tony and Mina were like the second great love that I uh, was privileged and honored to really be a witness to. It was an extraordinary relationship. So I'm always happy to have Mina here. And if people want to ask Mina questions, you know, I'm happy to share with her. Um, she knows more about Tony than I do. Um, I wanted to just um, do a very, very short introduction, if that's okay, and then I'm going to show you a little bit of the, um, of the documentary, about 13 minutes, of um, the portion on Aspida and the portion on the consent decree. I uh, interviewed Tony, uh, well, I met Tony in 1998 when she was considering moving back to New York from Puerto Rico. And um, she wanted to write her memoirs, and the first thing she said she asked me is, where's the history? Where's the history of Puerto Ricans in New York? 
And I was like, are you kidding? There's not very much written about us. It's just the stereotype. So you're going to have a hard time finding it. She said, no, 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 I'm a really good researcher. And so is Mina. And we're going to find the research. We're going to go to all the libraries. And she did. And a couple of months later, she calls me up. And she says, oh, my god. You were right. There's very little. There's garbage out there about I can't believe it. We have to do this project. I have to write my memoirs. We have to make a film. We have to do this. We have to do that. And then, you know, Tony really got very carried away and wanted to do this massive media project uh, to right all the wrongs. Um, and unfortunately, we didn't quite get there um, to do that. But Tony was a visionary. She was a visionary, an extraordinary planner, and a person who um, would look at you. She was born in Surrong, and I think that's probably why she had this, this ability to see who you could be as opposed to who you were in the moment. So being born in Surrong, Surrong is a, a, an old Basque word, and um, basically it means that in the south they say you're born with a call over your face. It's really that the amniotic um, sac is intact, and so the midwife had to break it open. And her parents and her grandmother and people in her family used to say, you know, this is a child with a special destiny because she survived coming out of that amniotic sac um, alive. And what she would do is that she would look at these young people because young people were her focus, and she would look at them and not see who they are in the moment. She would see the lawyer, she would see the doctor, she would see the philosopher, she would see the planner, she would see all these attributes, all these qualities in them. And she would say to them, I can, you're going to be a doctor. And they would say, like, what? I'm going to be a doctor. And she would say, I can see that you're going to be a doctor. I've heard you in the meetings, and you talk about biology, and you talk about science. And, and then all of a sudden, this child would say, I'm going to be a doctor. So she inspired people. She helped them to realize their potential. That's what I think made her, for me anyway, so incredibly extraordinary. I was speaking with a class earlier, and some of you may or may not know this, but Puerto Ricans are in many ways immigrants because we come with a different culture and a different language. But we are United States citizens and that makes us migrants. Um, 1917 we were um, made citizens of the United States just a few months before World War I. Um, what a happy coincidence so that we could go to World War I and fight um, on behalf of the United States. Um, and the United States has shaped the economy of Puerto Rico in very dramatic ways and um, what we had in the 50s, late 40s, 50s, and 60s, we had many of the folks in the agricultural countryside moving into the cities in Puerto Rico, and from the cities then having to move to New York. In many cases, they were recruited through a Bracero program to come and work on the Northeast of the United States, as well as in Hawaii. So there are Puerto Ricans in Hawaii um, who are still Puerto Rican. And actually, this little boy, I'm sorry, I got that from Tony. Um, he's not a little boy, he's a young man. Bruno Mars is half Puerto Rican and half Hawaiian. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, this is part of that whole exodus out of Puerto Rico. Um, so this Bracero program really brought people to the United States. At the same time that these programs from the Department of Labor are bringing Puerto Ricans to the United States, um, there is this um, interesting phenomenon that's happening after World War II, which is that the government and the social agencies are trying to get women back into the home from the workplaces. So during World War II, you remember, all these women went into the workforce. And now they had to get them back because the men returned and they wanted their jobs back. So the women had to go back in. So they had this huge campaign about the stability of the family. And the way in which it started to manifest itself was an emphasis on juvenile delinquency. So here come the Puerto Ricans, the others, the immigrants, the ones that can't speak English, who are an exceptionally young population. So guess who becomes the poster children for juvenile delinquency? The Puerto Ricans. And so feature films were made in the late 50s and the early 60s that really inscribed our stereotype as criminals, as oversexed, as um, unstable, um, as uh, for the women, fecund and promiscuous and easily available. And these stereotypes have continued in great measure to this day, extending themselves not just to Puerto Ricans, but to other Latino groups that have come to the United States. So if you're Latin, you're the Latin bombshell. Um, and you know, there are obviously stereotypes of other people. Um, I say this because I think it's really important the way in which the mass media 
um, really characterizes and depicts certain groups. And then those groups have quite a struggle to be able to break down those stereotypes and to create images of themselves that are really refuting those stereotypes. So it's not that we didn't have promiscuous women. Of course we did, because that's reality, right? Um, that everybody was promiscuous? No. So I want to just name a few of those wonderful films. Cry Tough, 1959, where John Saxon plays a Puerto Rican. If you remember, John Saxon was not born in Puerto Rico. Um, I want to talk about the Blackboard Jungle, where a Mexican played a Puerto Rican um, who um, is a pathological liar and stutters. And the only time he stops stuttering is when he has a knife in his hand, a phallic symbol. So again, reinscribing our sexuality. And um, I want to talk about West Side Story. I used it, fair use, fair use in the film. Um, so bear that in mind. When you make your documentaries, there's such a thing as fair use. And the other film I want to talk about is Young Savages. So in West Side Story, we become the juvenile delinquents. We're the gangsters. And again, this issue of, of our sexuality um, is inscribed in the American consciousness. It gets worse with the Young Savages, which was a really interesting film, because it is what is called um, um, a social problem film. It's problematizing um, assimilation in the United States, in New York in particular. It's problematizing a lot of the social theories that the sociologists were raising about juvenile delinquents. But the Puerto Ricans are really the pathological ones. Um, and so in that story, just to give you a sense of how bad it was, there's a blind warlord who is killed. He's a Puerto Rican warlord, and he's killed. And the reason why he's killed um, is because, unbeknownst to the audience, he's the warlord. But he's also the pimp of his young sister. And the mother knows that the brother is pimping out the daughter. Um, and so Telly Savalas is in it. Uh, this other guy, Lancaster, is in it. I mean, Dina Merrill. There's all these interesting stars. And um, we're inscribed as these juvenile delinquents of an extraordinary nature. Um, so I say that because much of our history is a hidden history, but the stereotypes prevail. You know, to the extent that people still cite mainstream media as a way to begin to define and determine who we are historically. Um, the other thing I want to say is that um, many of the young people who came to New York spoke Spanish, and they were children. Um, and you'll hear of one person's story. Uh, children who did not speak English, uh, the immersion theory was the way in which uh, children were, were assimilated into the educational process. So it was sink or swim. You didn't speak English? Tough. You were going to learn it, you know, by hook or by crook. A lot of children were placed in, because they couldn't speak English, they were placed in classes for um, um, CRMD. Um, oh my God, I just had a brain seizure. Uh, classes for retarded mental development. And so I had a cousin who was placed in one of those classes and never recovered from being identified as being retarded. I think it was like a self-fulfilling prophecy. She's just then, you know, escaped from the world. Um, so thousands of children were placed in there because we had about an 85% dropout rate. Uh, and again, because children didn't understand what was going on, they were just dropping out, including in elementary school, which, you know, in this day and age, you wouldn't believe. I want to say that there were social networks, but it really, in that time period in the Puerto Rican community, but the, the, the overwhelming group of people who really made a mark were Tony and her cohorts. And that's not to say that there were not others that came. There were labor organizers. There were community organizers. There were people from all over. Just come, 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 come on in, man. Um, but I believe that Tony's cohort was really looking at having impact across the city whereas the, the organizers from the earlier period were really looking at specific areas. Tony's position was, we're going to work with high school students because in four years they're going to be in college. And then four years after that, they're going to be the leaders of our community. And so that was her vision. That was what she um, wanted to create. And she really did say, we can do this for ourselves. She was one of the first people to take um, the anti-poverty money and start to create Puerto Rican organizations in the community. She was a founder of the Puerto Rican Forum, which engendered ASPIDA. Um, she was a founder of um, Universidad Boricua, which engendered Boricua College, which exists today. So she was just a founder of organizations. She just kept doing this all over the country. Um, you won't see this part in the film, but she went to San Diego, where she met Mina, um, and she started with Mina a school, a graduate school for community organizing. 
So she was always learning and always changing and um, really in tune with whoever it was that she worked with. Um, the last thing I'll say is that, um, and I'll talk about it later on, but um, I, I did 17 hours of oral history with uh, Tony before she passed. And this film was built around those 17 hours of oral history. And um, you know, I finally figured out what the narrative was, what the story, what's the story I want to tell? And then I took from the oral histories in order to tell that story. And then outside of oral histories, interviewed a lot of her cohorts in order to, to fill out, give texture to um, the story of her life and work. Um, so that's what I'm going to say. I'm going to show you about 13 minutes of the film, and then we can have a conversation, if you like. <laughs> I have researched that you will organize groups of young people in which it will be like a game. The club will be like a game. Kind of funny. And I thought it has to be a movement. And you have to give them the things that the gang will bring. Identification with a jacket, with symbol, with ceremony. I figure out is the, the, probably the first Puerto Rican owned and controlled organization uh, in the United States. They created Aspira clubs in high schools and they had a centralized staff and that developed a curriculum for working with the youth in the high schools, but also they, they would have workshops at the Aspira offices. Everything we were doing was new. We decided we would not have counselors, we'd have organized counselors, because that was a new concept. They had to have a the personality of an organizer, and at the same time train themselves in being counselors, educational counselors, like the counselors in the high schools. The name Aspira, a one word upbeat that incorporates in it the whole sense of what we're talking about, a command, Aspira, Aspira, a command to the kids. That age, is the one point where you can interfere and come in and break the cycle of poverty and break in and bring in knowledge where the young can change the world. My parents were very proud of the fact that I was like an honor student. When my father read the article in the Diario de la Prensa and he spoke to my mother and then he called me over, he said, Mira, nena, tu para ti, you know, it's, it's an organization that helps high school students who want to go to college. And see if you know they can help us. At that time, the executive director of Aspira was Dr. Antonia Pantoja. And so she was the person who met with us. She turned to me and she said, We're organizing Aspira clubs. And would you organize a club in your school? We organized it, we called it the Juan Morel Campos Aspira Club. When you grew up in a neighborhood which you venture very little out of that's your whole world i came from what you might call the wrong side of the track this organization in aspira it brought me out of that other world my world was the lower east side and all of a sudden new york city came into focus for me. So Aspira really opened up new horizons for all of us. I remember my father asking me about the cost of college. And I would tell him, hey, Bobby, it would probably cost $18,000. And I'd say, amigo, you know how much that is? You know how much I make? <laughs> it was through Aspira that I began to realize that I would likely to attend college with their help and I learned about financial aid and scholarships and applying to different schools. Another thing that I noticed was a lot of girls were in the club. We didn't have like the talks, presentation about the history of Puerto Rico, about the culture, but we also learned social skills too, this whole process of interacting. We used to have lots of parties and we learned how to do the boogaloo. <laughs> the boogaloo. <laughs> that surrounded Aspira for, you know, for many years. The Board of Education was number one 
of the company. They said, we don't accept those counselors you have because they don't have a license. And we said, tough. We don't counsel in your facilities, we counsel here. Second objection. So you want to segregate Puerto Ricans from the rest of them. We said, oh my God. When you segregate them, it's okay. When we do it, and this is not segregating, this is organizing for our own strength. And to have them finish school and not drop out. I used to get letters, abusive, and you know, with uh, all kinds of horrible language, and uh, calling me all kinds of names, and calling us all kinds of things. And taking our money here in New York, go back to where you belong. Those members of our community, including for a period of time in the 60s, the more radical elements in our community, who said Astira was, you know, just creaming and it was just focused on the cream of the crop of the Puerto Rican community. And I was not the cream of the crop in terms, I lived in the projects and my parents were working class. So I always used to say, what, what is this, you know, what are they knocking here? If it's bringing people who are developing a consciousness into truly understanding the needs of our community, what's wrong about that? We go into our culture and we say, okay, the areto. Eh? The Taino Indians used to celebrate an areto, where you drank something and you danced and you became imbued with a sense of an important moment. And the areto is held in a dark room, you turn off the lights, and everybody has a little candle, and you get light from the center candle. We all be sworn in as an aspirante, all walking in with our candles, all nicely dressed, and, and I, it made me proud of being a Puerto Rican. It was... In 63, we would discuss in our club meetings, you know, what was happening with the civil rights movement and how the situation of Puerto Ricans was so similar to what was happening to African Americans at that time. So it was like a way of saying, my God, you know, we're not stupid like they say we are, you know, we could really do this. It empowered us to feel that we had the capacity to gain these skills and the capacity to transform society. They bloom and they, they flower and, and they became these this, this fibers. <laughs> Some of them became young lords. Some of them became the student revolution of the 60s. Some of those people got their heads, you know, bashed by the police in, in, in closing city college. Because we came from Aspira, we were already planners, we were already organizing. We had organized in all our high schools already. Those that were graduating from high school weren't getting into the city colleges. So we called for a boycott. At 7 a.m., I was in my Volkswagen Beetle bug, came right on the campus, cops said you can't stop. I said, brother, it's time to get out. We're closing down the school. This is now Harlem University. We have sealed the campus after a series of assaults and fights as college opened this morning. And they got him out of Buell Gala there and got him by the, by the neck and closed his office and, and, and a student on his desk and told him, We're not, you're not going to get out of here until you listen to these demands. One of the things that we want to see was City College reflect the diversity of the graduating classes of the city's high schools. Number two, a second black and Puerto Rican school of studies. It wasn't a building. They took over the campus. This was a major event. My phone starts ringing off the phone because my friends telling me it's aspirantes inside. Today you look at the City College of New York and it's like 70% minority, which is a major accomplishment. All came from what it used to be 3%.
we started to learn from the youth what was happening to them in the schools. When I first went to kindergarten, I was slapped by the teacher for speaking in Spanish. And I went home and told my mother what had happened. And my mother did not know how to speak English, but she went over there and she gave them a piece of her mind. <laughs> the Lord says that they will take you to jail if you don't take your children to school. Let's turn it around. Okay, if the Lord says that I have to take my children to school, then I can accuse you as an institution where I have brought my children and you don't teach them. Now, in those days, we didn't talk a lot about special education. And uh, you heard about open air classes, you heard about special health classes, and so on. But Puerto Rican youngsters often were put into those classes, even though they had no problems with their health or anything like that, but the school system didn't know what to do with them. and purchasing special instructional materials to help the teachers in the disadvantaged areas of the city. There are no funds to help increase the number of Negro and Puerto Rican teachers in our system, nor any incentive fund to encourage new ideas to be tried out in the districts. I became like a, like a lion. The discussion was beginning within Aspida and other community groups that it might require litigation to obtain some of the goals that we were striving for. This was a lawsuit of major importance to the Puerto Rican community. And this was in the time of our civil rights, people bringing all kinds of actions on the basis of the fact that they were being denied due process, they were being denied an equal opportunity. teach the children in the language of their culture. And teach English in an effective way. There's no question in my mind that had it not been for the consent decree, we would not have gotten Latino teachers into the school system at that point. The Board of Education is a big monster to fight. And, uh, and I fought the monster. Um, I wanted to say something about what happened to Puerto Ricans when we arrived in the United States. Um, when we arrived in the United States, the United States was um, really um, looking at race in a binary fashion. You were either white or you were black. And Puerto Ricans were and continue to be a mixed race people. And so we did not identify as either. Some people identified as white because, you know, clearly there's racism in Puerto Rico. Um, so we can't deny that, which is really tied with class in a way that's not quite the same um, reality in the United States. And so when we came here, um, there was this push-pull about who we identified with. And I think it's really important to note that Tony's position was that we were not going to assimilate into this quote-unquote melting pot because she felt like the melting pot really was um, acceptance of the dominant norm, the dominant society. And so you, if you decided you were going to assimilate, you had to give up everything to become somebody else. And her cohort, um, and earlier cohorts, but her cohort in particular, institutionalized this notion of not assimilating. And they were one of the first groups to really look at the hyphen. She started by saying, we are Puerto Rican New Yorkers. And then she moved to, we are Puerto Rican Americans. But she never said we're Americans. She always said we're Puerto Rican and we're something else. 
You know, we belong to this country, we're going to be in this country, we're going to stay in this country. But we're not giving up our language and we're not giving up our culture. And that was something that I think was really important because it's not something that's been recognized that, that that's a contribution that Puerto Ricans made. So the bilingual um, struggle, the struggle for bilingual education was really extremely significant. And I didn't know how significant it was mm -hmm. until Tony actually organized a conference at the CUNY Graduate Center, Contra Mal y Marea. And um, there were a group of students from CUNY there, and this Polish boy was there with his class, and he got up and he said, because uh, they were talking about the consent decree, and he said, I didn't know that I was in a bilingual class because Puerto Ricans fought for bilingual education. And everybody in the room just like turned around and looked at him and thought, oh my god, we never thought about other groups other than Puerto Ricans benefiting from bilingual education. But that's the reality um, of, of you know the struggle that Puerto Ricans um, took on and actually won. I say won with a caveat that bilingual education was not funded the way that it needed to be because the city was in a financial crisis, a fiscal crisis in the 70s when the consent decree came in and so there was no standardization of what bilingual education was and it was dismantled. I mean really just piece by piece it was dismantled over the years. Um, so you'll have dual language schools. Um, but I did want to mention that about race and color because um, I think it's really important the issue of race and color in the Puerto Rican community when Tony was a young woman, I am sure, I don't know this for a fact, although we did have a lot of conversations about race and color, um, I don't know this for a fact, but I do believe because she was socialized in a country that really pushed towards um, the European and whiteness, um, you know, we had all these ways of, of talking about, well we still do, all these ways of talking about color and race in Puerto Rico. So I believe that Tony really went through a personal journey of beginning to discover herself as a black Puerto Rican that she did not identify as a, a black Puerto Rican when she was a young woman. But by the time of her passing, she absolutely and totally identified as a black Puerto Rican. Her family was a black Puerto Rican family. She was the most light-skinned of her family. Um, so I felt like that was really important to throw in there because it's not something, when you think about race or color, you don't think about Puerto Ricans. But I think as hybridity becomes more the norm, and you think about the fact that there's so many different mixtures of people. Um, we were one of the early hybrids. Um, so I thought I would just say that. Um, uh, I guess I'll open it up to questions, if you have any. It's an oral history question. So you said that um, you, would, you did 17 hours of interviewing. I'm wondering how and I'm assuming that Antonio was a really amazing narrator. How did how did your interviews change over time? Hmm. So, um, you know, I um, I asked her to sort of do the trajectory of her life and tell me about um, what she had done. I looked at a lot of she had some videotapes. People had done interviews with her, so I looked at some of those videotapes. Um, I think the questions got a little deeper. I think they got a little more probing as we got to the end. There's a section you haven't seen in the film, um, which wasn't part of the oral history, that, you know, in the oral history she was telling me her life story, so it was nice and wonderful and seamless in some ways. But she was a human being with, you know, all kinds of flaws and, and, and really interesting um, mm -hmm. um, traits. And I asked her if she was ever afraid, because I felt like people were going to want to know that. Um, and she really didn't want to talk about uh, these really uh, sort of, and she was a really private person. She didn't. But, you know, I really went after her, and I kept at it. And I kept saying, how are people going to know you as a human being if you don't open up? So in the oral history, it really was about what she did. The film part was really, who are you? So I would say that. Um, that's what I learned. I learned that I had to move away from what's your story, because she was so private, to who are you. And you know, we did a lot of interviews with her in Puerto Rico, actually, where she was skating and you know, dodging, and she was great at it. Um, and you know, eventually I got these little kernels out of her, but it was really much more for the documentary. But her story was her story, you know, uh, which was pretty fascinating, actually. Yeah. Any other questions? No. 
That's it. Um, <laughs> so, how long did the project take um, from the beginning till the end? And how has your thinking um, and, and your understanding of who she is in the role changed during that time? And like in the gap from then to now? Wow. Well, you know, um, no film can capture um, all the aspects of a person or all of, you know, what they experienced. I was at her commitment center. I was with her when she passed. Um, so, you know, my understanding of her now is so much more deeper. Um, you know, I'm hoping somebody else will make another film about her that will capture some of the things that I didn't capture. Um, I think that she was, um, she became a, a, a really, as I, so the film started somewhere like around 2001. We started to raise money for it, but I wasn't really in filmmaking mode. She passed in 2002, and I thought, oh my God, now how am I gonna make a film? Like, you know, she's gone, and I don't have any footage of her. Because I wasn't thinking about the oral history as footage for a documentary. Mm -hmm. um, it was an oral history. And, you know, then I sort of floundered around for a while and was trying to make the migration film. And then was showing that around, and people were like, where's Tony? Where's Tony? She's sort of lost in this. And then um, had a crisis, worked on another film, and then came back and said, okay, so now I think it's gonna be about Tony, and it's about her life. And then I said, I'm gonna use the oral histories, and this is how I'm gonna frame it, and I got up to this point. As I mentioned earlier, um, you know, I thought her work in New York was most important. But if I was gonna really show the full dimension of who she was and how she had grown, then I had to, look at the work that she did in San Diego, and I had to look at the work that she did in Puerto Rico, and I had to look at some of her deliberations. So she wanted to move to Nicaragua. So part of the film talks about her going to a conference in Nicaragua, being totally taken by the Nicaraguan Revolution, and she was gonna go and you know be with the Nicaraguan revolutionaries. And then she calls Mina. She says, I think I'm gonna go to Nicaragua. And Mina said, what? <laughs> Mina said, no, you have unfinished business. She said, you have unfinished business in Puerto Rico. And she said, oh, that's right. I've done all these things all over the country. I have to go to Puerto Rico. I have unfinished business in Puerto Rico. And Mina and Tony moved to Puerto Rico. So the work that she did in Puerto Rico was you know, just like the extension of what she had done in New York, what she had done in San Diego. By the time she had gotten to San Diego, she had become a Marxist. She knew about political economy. She had really embraced art as central to community development. She didn't think solely in political and economic terms. Now she thought in terms of art and the way in which art makes community come alive. And it became a central component of her organizing for the school. And so she had a theater group that she incubated at the school. She had three galleries. I mean, she used to do activities in the community, um, you know, I had all these goofy pictures of her on this stage. She, she was very tiny with this huge afro, and I had all these pictures of her on the stage where these, you know, Aztec dancers in the background were dancing, and you know, she was almost uh, dwarfed by them. So I didn't use it, but it really, it was her, the way in which she just kept developing um, mm -hmm. as a person. And then at the end, I think, um, you know, she said, "I don't know." Oh, I'm gonna get emotional. Um, I don't know how to do this. And I kept saying, well, you don't know how to do what? She said, I don't know how to die. And I said, well, I think you do it the way you live your life. And that's exactly what she did. She brought everybody who was close to her. She was incredibly collaborative in what she did. She was the boss, but she was really collaborative. She would always ask people, what do you think? What do you think I should do? What do you think we should do? And at the end, that's what she did. She brought everybody together and said, what do you think I should do? And we said, this is what we think you should do. And she said, okay, this is what I'm gonna do. <laughs> and then she did it. Um, so, she, by the end of this film, I mean, she just became this extraordinarily deep and, you know, rich, <clears throat> complicated, complicated person. You know, she was really insecure, like all of us, right? And that's what human beings are. She was really insecure. She never manifested that insecurity except to, you know, people she was close to. Um, and I wanted to capture some of that. I, uh, the other thing I'll say is, I wanted people to say bad things about her. I know Mina doesn't like when I say this, but it's true. I wanted people to be antagonistic, to say, no, I don't think she did this, or I disagreed with her, and we had a fight. By the time I got to the film, you know, when people die, they become saints. 
and then you know you can't say anything bad about them. I don't know if in other cultures that's the reality, but for Puerto Ricans, you can't say anything bad about somebody. So all these people who I knew hated her would not say anything on camera. I had one person who I who said, "Will you say something?" You know, because you had a fight. They had a fight. They had a political struggle, and she he bested her in this political struggle. I mean, that's my interpretation of it, right? She wouldn't say that. She would say, "I walked away." <laughs> I, would say, I think he won the struggle, Tony. Um, and I said to him, so will you say this on camera, that you had this political difference? It was about political ideology, it was a struggle around politics. And he said, yeah. And then when I went to ask him, he said, oh, I couldn't say that about her. Yeah. I was like, why? So oh, she's passed. I can't say that about her. <laughs> so you're not going to see any of that. You know, For drama, you need conflict. You need tension. <laughs> And there certainly was drama and tension in her life. I mean, you know, there were a lot of people who did not like her. Um, so, yeah, she became a really quite richer person to me. You, you said that she was a really private person. Uh, how did you negotiate that when you're making the film after she had passed and you couldn't sort of check in with her about what was okay and not okay to put into it? So I'll tell you a story about how I, how I outed her or how Mina outed her. So, you know, I had said to her, we went to see Chetty Moraga. I don't know how many people know Chetty Moraga and her work. So Chetty Moraga does spectacular work. She's a powerhouse. And I said, let's go, and I had met her once at a conference. Um, I had fallen in love with her at a conference. I was like, wow, she's cool. Um, so she was going to recite, she was going to, you know, do a presentation at the CUNY Graduate Center. So Mina and, and Tony and I went. And she was like, oh, and I introduced them. And she was like, she's wonderful, she's great. And she said, well, you know, blah, 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 I'm out, right? And we were in the car and I'm driving. I'm like, what are you, crazy? No, you're not out. So we're having this conversation with her as I'm driving. She's like, yeah, I'm out, I'm out, I'm out. So I said, well, you know, Tony, I'm going to have to deal with this in the film. She said, you do what you have to do in this film. It's your film. I'm not going to tell you how to do your film. You, you make your own film. You make your film. So I'm like, OK, and I'm dancing around the fact that she's a lesbian. I'm dancing around, I'm dancing around. So I put a little thing in. Well, Mina says, oh, me and Tony met, uh, and whatever. And I go to Aspida to see these little kids who look like my grandchildren, I swear to God. And they're mixed. You know, it's not just Puerto Ricans. They're from all over the place, including African American, Arab, um, Asian. I mean, it was just extraordinary. So these little children, I mean, that's how I thought of them, right? These little children. I show them the, the, what was then the rough cut, where I'm dancing around her being a lesbian, and these kids start to ask questions. So I'm like, yeah, sure, what is it? Did she get married? No. Was that her daughter in the film? No. Was she a lesbian? I'm like, oh. <laughs> I'm like, yes. And this little girl, I'll never forget this moment. I always say this. This little tiny girl gets up and she puts her hand on her hip and she says, you're not being fair. And I'm like, what? She said, you're not being fair. You have to say who she is. <laughs> and I must have like taken a few steps back and thought, oh my god. She just pumped me out. <laughs> oh my God. And, you know, I had a lot of struggle around this. My sound person, I said to him, I'm going to see Julio. I'm going to ask these questions about Tony being gay, about the gay community and the contributions they made to the Puerto Rican community. And I want him to talk about her being gay. And he said, What are you crazy? You're going to ruin her legacy. And I was like, What? Now he adored her. He adored her. And he said that to me. And I thought, Oh my God, I'm going to ruin her life. See, now I'm in trouble. So when that little girl said that to me, and a couple of other kids were like, yeah, 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 absolutely. They all were like, yeah, you should do this. <laughs> I went into the editing room, and I said, I'm going to bite the bullet, and I don't give a shit what happens. Whatever comes, comes. I'm going to do it. Because if those children are brave enough, you know what I mean, to put it out there, then I'm going to put it out there. And I have to tell you that in screenings, people have said to me, why did you deal with her sexuality? That has nothing to do with who she is. <laughs> wow. and I'm like, are you kidding me? That's exactly who she is. That's why I dealt with it. I couldn't do a film about her. I, mean, I could have, right, until the kids outed me. Um, <laughs> I couldn't do a film about her if I didn't talk about who she was. And who she was was a lesbian. That was like so profoundly deep inside of her. She acted out of that in everything that she did. How could I not 
do that. And they were like, oh, we don't think that's important. And I said, well, it's okay. We didn't make the film. Right. Well, I did. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, it was very scary for me because I did get a lot of flack from people who said, you know, she's the first recipient of the Medal of, you know, Freedom, uh, first Puerto Rican woman, 1996, President Clinton, yada, yada. And I was like, that's right. And the way that I cut it was that after she gets that medal, you hear she's a lesbian. That's the way I cut it, because I said, oh yeah, now you, I'm going to put it in your face, because he honored her. She was honored. So, um, it was a journey for me as well, you know? So, you know, I was a good ally, but I was really afraid of ruining her legacy. And those kids said, do it. And I said, you know what, when the kids tell you to do something, when the children speak, you got to listen, because they're, they're fearless. They're fearless. So, you have to be fearless like them. I'm curious about um, if, if Tony spoke to her experience of her gender in being a part of the movement. Um, I, hmm. I've heard, uh, I've heard you talk about um, the, how race was talked about and perceived and how, and in the film, the civil rights movement um, kind of providing that, that feedback and involvement in that sort of a setting, but there was also the women's movement, and um, and so I'm a bit right. And so I, my experience of movements and movement building is that gender is very contentious, and that that within movement communities, um, women tend to be sidelined. So I was wondering if Tony spoke to that, or just oh. her experience of being a woman. Oh, absolutely. I mean, she really did. I mean, she was very clear that women. I mean, you must remember, she was operating in the 50s in New York, and the Puerto Rican community was ruled by men. Now, well, okay, so here, here's what Tony, here's Tony's theory on it. When the small community-based organization started to emerge, it was women. They were built on the backs of women in the community. Now, when the money started to come in, mm -hmm. then the men started to take over. And she always said the women were taken out of their leadership roles and the men stepped in when the money came in. And so all these women who had helped build all these organizations, Joseph Nieves, Alice Cardona, Yolanda Sanchez, and all these people who had been in her cohorts, they were pushed aside. And then the men, the career, and the careerist men, so it was men who were really buying the capitalist model of achievement. They came in and they took over all these organizations. And she was really clear. I mean, towards the end of her life, she didn't care. She was just like, she'd get up there and she'd tell everybody. The men took over, and you did it because the money came, and blah, 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 blah. So she was pretty clear about the role of gender and the way in which women had been shunted aside. Is that not accurate, Mina? When we did our art program, we sponsored uh, some of the first female uh, comic, I want to say comedians, but comedians, and one of those is, uh, what's her name? Oh, Kathy Najimi. Kathy Najimi. You remember Kathy from Sister Act? Well, she started with a woman's uh, theater, theater group, and she would project images of oppression against women, uh, images of uh, the contradictions that women had to face in their lives. And we at the graduate school mm -hmm. at our Multicultural Art Institute was the only home base that would receive her and give her license to work. She did not identify with a feminist movement because, as you know now, many of us women of color believe that we have been excluded from the uh, definition of that movement. Good. I went to a women's conference in Minnesota, women's history conference in Minnesota, and I showed the film. And I, you know, it wasn't yet finished, so you know, it didn't have the soundtrack on it. Had other music, uh, a little goofier. Um, and I was like, oh, okay, so, you know, if they get a little round of applause, it'll be fine. You know, it'll be cool. I'll walk away happy. And the film finished, and all these women, I have to tell you, these women who were like international students came up to me crying. And I was like, oh, what's going on here? So I had this German woman come up to me. She was sobbing, and I was like, why is she crying? What's wrong? She said, I'm so inspired. I didn't know anything about Puerto Ricans. And she inspired me. I want to do something. And I was like, oh, my God. And then this Cuban woman said, I don't know about Puerto Ricans. And she was like so emotional. So all these women from like other places, mostly German, I have to tell you, that's really surprising to me. All these German women came up that day and said, but I'd say in general, the response has been really 
very positive. She's a compelling character. So you may take exception with the structure. You may take exception with something. But I mean, I think in the long run, I captured her spirit. That's what I did. I captured her spirit, who she was. Okay. Not everything about her, but her spirit. And you know, the people that knew her intimately, I really waited for them to tell me, what do you think? And they would say, oh my god, I can't believe it. You captured her spirit. Um, and for me, that was like one of the most important things to do. Now, I want to talk some of the technical stuff, all right? So we've got all our oral history stuff out of the way. <laughs> I was told that there was no, um, no eight millimeter Super 8 footage of Puerto Ricans, right? Puerto Ricans told me, because I could say, I want to use Super 8. I want to use eight millimeter. You know, when I was growing up, we had eight millimeter in our family, and people took pictures of us. You know, they're lost now, I'm sure. It's the case for most folks. So I put a call out. Lo and behold, who should show up? This aspirante, Enilda Lozado. All the Super 8 footage in there is hers. Mm -hmm. And they are aspirantes. All of those kids were Aspira students. So I was stunned that I actually got Super 8 footage of Aspira students. So those kids who are dancing all goofy and stuff, what's of all the aspirantes? You know, I can name some of them now because I've met them during the course of the, the interviews that I did. Um, so that was the first thing. Second thing, when I looked for footage of Puerto Ricans, right, because you need B-roll. Especially when, you know, Latino Public Broadcasting told me to take Tony out of the film, even though it's a film about her, because, you know, she wasn't shot well. Um, I had to look for a lot of archival footage, you know, to represent that time period. And I thought, okay, so I'll find some footage somewhere. And I have to tell you, I have to scour um, every single television station in New York and beyond for footage that wasn't about crime, criminals, prison, junkies, delinquents, uh, and so I did find some footage. I found a, a short film that was made by NBC on the bilingual education program. And so that's actually a, a bilingual school, the first bilingual school in the Bronx. Um, and uh, one of the women in it is uh, an early educator who's like the mother of all the Puerto Rican educators uh, in the United States. And when I showed it to her, she was, you know, going to pass out and die. So I found footage of <laughs> all kinds of people. People didn't know that they had been videotaped. So I found them in their youth. Um, it's extremely expensive to purchase archival footage. So it can be over $120 a second. Now, I'm not joking. It's not a minute. A second. $90 a second. And if you have music on it, and it's original music, you pay more. So I got material from CNN. I got material from CBS. ABC, um, not Fox, although I went to Fox. Um, I got material from television stations in Puerto Rico. I mean, I got footage from everywhere, and I paid over $15,000 just in archival footage. And I was so sparing with that archival footage. So it's really expensive to use archival footage. Fair use, I want to talk about fair use, because that's really, really, really important. I was just in a documentary, um, um, real R-E-E-L stereotypes, which should be circulating around, about Latino stereotypes. And every single film in there is, they used, they did not pay a penny for it. And they used every single feature film you could ever imagine that had Puerto Ricans, Mexicans, Latinos in it. And they used fair use. And the first thing you saw after the title was fair use. <laughs> Huge! <laughs> because it's for educational purposes. It's an educational uh, video. So I used the West Side Story, which would have cost me thousands and thousands of dollars, thousands and thousands of dollars for that footage because I had to get not just the rights from the filmmakers but from the families of um, oh my God, the choreographer, the, the writer of the music, um, Bernstein. I mean, I, and I did, I did try to track them all down and finally resorted to fair use because I couldn't track them all down. They wouldn't respond to me and I couldn't afford it anyway. Um, and then the way that I got out of, you haven't seen this footage, there's some footage of the 30s where people are dancing, because Tony used to go to the movies in Puerto Rico, and that's how she knew the United States, was through the movies. So I used footage of the 30s, and what I did was I went to this place that sells trailers. So they will sell you the trailers from these old movies for $1,000. You can use as much of that trailer as you want for $1,000. So I had to find all these ways in which, you know, reduce cost. So it's extremely expensive. There was some footage that I got from a person who wanted to become a consultant on the film. Um, so a lot of the footage is of the Bronx, but I made it was like New York, everywhere. And he wanted to become a consultant on the film, plus he wanted me to give him 
a licensing fee. And I was like, <laughs> so then I waited a couple of years and eventually I checked to see if it was in the public domain. And because it was made with government money, it was in the public domain. So all those years he's been charging people <laughs> for licensing rights when it was in the public domain because it had been made with government money. So look to the government for the films that they make because they're in the public domain and you don't have to pay for them. You may have to pay for duplication, but you don't have to pay for them. So I got some footage from um, you know, the Congress, uh, the Library of Congress, and all I had to do was just you know, pay for the, the transfer of, I think it was 35 millimeter, to um, a DVD. But you know, I could never afford that footage. So it's extremely expensive. Even though you know equipment is uh, lower in cost, if you really want to get to like public television, which most of us do because it's a wider audience, um, the reality is that it's going to cost you. And if you want to put it up on the net, the same rules prevail. Mm -hmm. um, so you have to get the rights for the net. So some of this will not be able to go up on the net because I don't have the rights for it. And in a couple of years, some of the rights will refer back, will revert back to the companies. And so. I'm stuck with having to raise money to get the rights again because I couldn't afford any more than that. So those are the considerations I think it's really important for you to think about because the net, the internet now is a place where many more people want to put stuff on and they'll put stuff on and then they have to take it down. So I know that a lot of YouTubes have been taken down. Um, you know, I do small videos and my colleagues are always saying, put it up on YouTube. And I'm like, I can't put it up on YouTube. I don't have permission for this footage. So I can't steal somebody's footage and then put it up and make believe that it's mine. That's, I can't, that's not ethical. So I've been trying to track down people and get permission from them and then say, this is the specific way I'm going to use it. It's for this, community organizing, and it's for YouTube. Those are the only two ways I'm going to use it. And then, for the most part, people will give me permission. So I just got permission from somebody in Brazil um, for a film on stop and frisk because I'm using pieces of that mm -hmm. in this other DVD I'm doing. So I told her, this is who I am, here's my political credentials, et cetera, et cetera. Give me your footage for free, we're all volunteers, I'm paying out of pocket for this DVD. And she was like, oh, I'm so happy you want to use my footage. And I thought, oh my god, she has to be young. She has to be <laughs> part of the indie media people. I know it because an old timer would say, no, honey, you got to pay me. <laughs> so um, I did want to say those things about um, archival use. Um, and sometimes people will sign releases and say they will be in your film and they will back out and you have to take them out. So I had a situation, not with this film, where I was doing a tape called Sister Song about women of color in the reproductive health movement and being ignorant of many aspects of native culture. I asked the woman who I was going to videotape if it was okay to shoot portions of the sweat lodge that she was doing in Oxnard, California. And she said, I'm going to speak to the elders, and they're going to let me know if it's OK for you and what you can do. And so I, I, based on what she said, I shot what she said I could shoot. And then I showed it, because it was a collaborative, and I showed it to the collaborative. And this one woman, I think she was Apache, and she said, I want nothing to do with this project. I was like, what? She said, I want nothing to do with this project. You're like Columbus. You raped us. I was like, what? I was like, what? What? And then she said, I, I, we can't support this project. And she lobbied. And I thought, oh my god, what did I do wrong? And so I said, you have to tell me what I did wrong. And she said, this is a Lakota tradition. And you didn't go to the Lakota, because they told you, they would have told you you can't do this. And I had to take out everything. And I did. I told them, I'm taking out everything you say I can't do. And we figured out a way to do whatever we had to do with the sweat lodge so that we were not um, we were not violating another culture's um, prohibitions. It was very hard. It was the profane. We were doing something that was profane to them. And I was so upset that she would think that, you know, me with my political consciousness, that I would consciously, you know, want to hurt somebody else. But I had to take it. There was nothing I could do. She was right. And I was wrong. And so you have to rectify when you do something wrong, even if it costs you money. And so we took it out, and you know, the film is fine. The film works. Um, we focused on the young women and why they wanted to do a sweat lodge, and you know, the piece worked. It would have been more gorgeous if we had had the other material, but that material will never be used. So, you know, I think the thing is you have to know about this, especially if you're not from another, you know, culture. You have to know what the prohibitions are. Um, and in some cases, 
um, you know, the prohibitions are really very serious. And in some cases, you know, you can negotiate. So that's probably the best thing you can do. I have a quick question. So can you talk, you were starting to mention other projects. Can you talk about <coughs> how being a Puerto Rican woman documentarian um, shapes the projects you select? And the second piece is I brought a bunch of my students who were in a Latin American women's class at John Jay College. If they, if they have stories to tell as well, and maybe documentary is a way to tell their stories, what would you tell them if we're just starting? I would tell them to go to oral history. <laughs> but I would tell them. Because it's cheaper and easier to do. I mean, it's not easy, but you know, to take on a full-fledged documentary. Like most people will say, oh, I want to. Yeah, I want to make a 90 minute film. And I'm like, why? Classrooms are 45, 50 minutes. Why would you make a 90 minute film? They're going to see it in pieces. Make a 30 minute film. And then they can have a conversation about it. So, you know, knowing your audience is really important. So, um, I lead from the emotional. So, I have this, you know, really interesting intellect, right? I've been around the block many times. But I lead from the emotion. And so, once I know what the story is, my selects are always going to be. Does, how does this tell the story? Does this tell the story in that it drives mm -hmm. things forward? Does it tell the story because it punctuates? Does it tell the story because it makes people cry? Because it makes them feel human? Because it makes them feel something very deep? So I feel like the kinds of media that I make, I'm always looking for people to feel deeply. Because I feel like in this society, we're anesthetized. We're desensitized. We don't know what it feels like to feel some things. I don't know what I'm feeling. I know exactly what I'm feeling. I'm angry, you know? I'm hurt. I'm happy, you know? I'm in rapture. So for me, it's, and I think, you know, part of being, coming from a culture that in some cases is in touch with that in ways that aren't always helpful, um, and in ways that are extremely helpful, that are extremely human. Um, really informs the work that I do. So I want to capture the essence of a person if I can. That's what I want, more than anything else. But I also want to make people feel. And even if it means that it hurts. So if you, know, you have to remember something that hurts, that's OK. So when I first started showing the film, a lot of the people from the older generation who had never been asked, what was it like growing up at a time of rabid racism against Puerto Ricans in New York? They'd never been asked. I mean, people would get up in screenings and like start like yelling and, and you know like, ah! and I would be like, they're venting. They were never asked. And here's an opportunity for them to say what happened to them. So for instance, there's a story in here about Alice Cardona going with her mother. She's a little girl knocking on a door. And the woman says, are you? Because she says, the mother says to, the little, to Alice, gracias a Dios un apartamento. Thanks be to God an apartment. And the woman says, are you Puerto Rican? And the mother says, yes. And she says, we don't rent to Puerto Ricans. And she slams the door in her face. That kicked up so much stuff for people in audiences. That kicks up an enormous amount. Julio talks about being beat up because he's a spick. That brings up stuff. A lot of people uh, react to Digna being slapped because a lot of people were slapped. So I, went, I learned how to speak English when I was four years old. I was Spanish dominant. I had a traumatic experience in learning how to speak English, but I learned it fast. And I remember there were Cuban um, young girls who came. I went to Catholic school where they torture you. And, um, <laughs> and so these Cuban young women didn't speak English. And I remember one of them got up and she said to me, I have to go to the bathroom. And so I said to her, say, I have to go to the bathroom. And she was like, I can't. And she was like this, I can't. No puedo, no puedo. Dile a la maestra. You know, tell the teacher, tell the teacher. And I was like, she has to go to the bathroom. And the nun would say, she has to say it. And I would be like, what's wrong with this? And then I would say, but she has to go. Look, she's going to do it on herself. She said, she has to say it. And the girl starts crying. And I'm like, <laughs> and she peed on herself. She peed on herself. She was mortified. And then what did the nun do? She told her she was a filthy pig, and she had to leave the room. So if you're never asked, those are your experiences, right? Over and over and over, because it's not just one time. Well, then, you know, finally, when you see somebody expressing it, it's like, I want to say it. So that's going to be the reality for the oral histories that you do. Sometimes people will be asked for the first time, what was your experience? Remember a lot of people, you know, I did this whole thing about from the margins to the center. Um, we were always on the margins. So what is it like to be in the center where all of a sudden people are looking at you and they're asking you and everything that you say, people get overwhelmed with the newness of the telling. 
and you have to be prepared for that telling. Um, I would say go to oral history first because it's cheaper, it's easier, and easier, you know, because this takes, uh, it's an elaborate thing. It took me six, seven years to do this film, but that's because, you know, I was a little crazy in the middle of it um, because I was doing two films at one. Um, so I would say ask them to do the oral histories and to do the oral histories of the people in their community that they respect and love because nobody's going to capture that information. So it doesn't matter what community you come from. You want to capture those people in that community that mean something to you. So I always say, go to your mothers, go to your grandparents. Nobody's ever asked them. You know, I took my mother to, to City College when I was a student there. We lived right across the street from City College. She'd never been inside. And I told her, Ma, come with me. And she said, oh, I can't go there. I'm, I'm, I'm nobody. And these are students. These are learned people. And I was like, they're full of shit. Come on. We'll go to <laughs> and she went with me. She didn't want to go. I worked for Museo del Barrio. She did the same thing. Nobody ever asked her. I asked her. So, you know, when you have people who nobody ever asked them, and then you finally ask them, oh my God, you know, it's, it's, you know, I said before that when people do oral histories, they change before your eyes. They become young again. They become those people they used to be. And it's a pleasure to watch them. It's a pleasure. You know, they're like, when they remember, it's fabulous. I mean, there's nothing better, honestly. You know, I used to do films before I did oral histories, and I would put the monitor, right, in the old days of, of old-fashioned video, we put the monitor, and I would stand behind the monitor to watch the women watching themselves. Because that was the pleasure for me that they would see themselves. They were on the screen. Who they really were, you know? They were fighting for their rights, and they were on the screen. There's no greater, for me, there's no greater pleasure than that. So, um, you know, tell them to do oral histories, because, you know, those stories can be so extraordinary, and, you know, they'll never be captured, unless your students capture them. That's what I would say. I have a question about um, Antonia's work. Um, I was wondering if it was easier for her to actually like rally up all the support and all, and to actually do this during a time of like revolution and when people like wanted their voices to be heard, as opposed to me, let's say I wanted to focus like on the on the Dominican, the later wave of like immigrants and how they came to let's say Washington Heights here, where the Puerto Ricans went to Elias and to Barrio. But like something that is kind of bothering me now is that like I see Washington Heights being like pretty really gentrified and changing, and our culture not being there. And Dominicans as like um, and Dominicans like not having their culture there anymore, not having a place to like go when they come from the yard, whether it be legal or Ill illegal. Mm -hmm. So I don't see any support. Like let's say I wanted to start programs for like kids or whatever, like tutoring programs. I don't see, in middle schools, I don't see sports teams, I don't see tutoring clubs, I don't see anything in, in these neighborhoods. And I was just wondering if it was easier for her to do it because it was a time of revolution and people had these ideologies, even though there were so many other negative things going on. Oh, interesting. I mean, it's interesting that you think that that time was a time of revolution. <laughs> So, you know, Tony started organizing in the 50s, and it was not a time of revolution. It was a time of civil rights. Civil rights. Um, but civil rights, remember, was not in the mainstream. It became mainstream much later on. It was always peripheral. And the most radical elements within the civil rights movement stayed marginal. So, you know, the push in any society is that anything that is radical out of the, out of the, out of the center and on the margins get squeezed into the middle and homogenized. So um, I think it's important to remember that. So we're in this moment of incredible pressure to homogenize things, right? So we're at a height of consumerism that didn't exist in the 50s, right? That was the beginnings of this consumerist movement. So um, there were movements all over the world. There were independence, decolonialization movements all over the world. You know, India in 1959, I think becomes independent, uh, 59 for Cuba, um, 61 for some other country, the Congo. I mean, I'm just thinking about like all these national wars of liberation that were happening around the world and people in the United States, including the civil rights movement, are looking out and seeing all of this happening. But the United States was in an extremely conservative mode, extremely traditional. 
um, except for the pockets of resistance. So um, I think it's really important to understand that Tony started organizing at a time when there was very little philanthropic um, support for not-for-profits, very little not-for-profits, period. Um, and so she went uh, to the foundations and, you know, the few that would support her, that's how she started these organizations. They were minuscule budgets and people were working, you know, 70 hours for like pennies. Um, I don't think that it was necessarily easier. I think there was a sense of mission and a sense of need and urgency that just kept people moving forward, you know, even if it was really hard. I think later on, you know, you have the people who are in this cohort of what we would call the reformers, right, Tony and her group, who ultimately turned out to be revolutionary. That's what's so interesting. And then you have the second wave, the people she trained in some cases, who were the radicals. And then the radicals, um, you know, were looking for support, how to do it. Um, and then you have movements dissipating. And then you have, I think, the beginnings of movements. So, you know, um, the Wall Street folks are the beginnings of a movement. But I would say that they're in Kuwait. You know, they're not yet fully gelled. There's a lack of an ideology. We were guided by Marxist principles. The majority of us were guided by Marxist ideology. Um, so we had an ideology to work with. There are multiple ideologies now, and they're very confusing. Um, social movements have been debunked in some ways, and, and in many ways they've been disparaged, like you didn't do anything. What did you do? You didn't do anything. The reality is that the majority of people in this room wouldn't be here if it hadn't been for all of those social movements. Um, so, you know, we have to think about the fact that we're in a really different time. So you start small to build big. That's what you have to do. You have to start small. You work with people who have similar interests, and then you start to build from there, and you create these little pockets. I want to say that even though gentrification may be happening, never underestimate people's resistance to the decimation of their culture. And I think we look to the Native Americans for that survival. Everything else is going to be gone, but we're going to survive, and we're going to hold on to whatever we can hold on to. So I think there are pockets of uh, extreme pockets in um, Washington Heights of Dominican culture. Absolutely. It's being manifested every single day. When people visit each other, that's Dominican culture happening right then and there. Um, so I think we have to think about the ways that we define culture and we define resistance because resistance is incredibly complicated and people have an infinite um, array of resources that they utilize when they want to resist. And it can be passive aggressive, and it's not usually confrontational, um, but there's resistance going on. And we need to be able to look and see where that resistance is happening, and then work in those pockets of resistance. So it's like we have to look for the nuances. We have to be not looking for the big explosions, because they're not going to happen. Look for the smaller ones, and then work within that. Um, you know, and see that it's a lifelong task, and that you need to take breaks from it. You know, when I was in the movement, we burned ourselves out. It was seven days a week. You know, it was relentless. It was, we got sick. Mm -hmm. We didn't have money to take care of ourselves. So we have to replenish. I think the other thing I would say is that if you're going to be involved in any kind of um, social organizing, political organizing, I think you have to take care of yourself. And for women, that's really important because women don't normally, they're taking care of everybody else. So I think self healing is really important. Um, and being in touch with the healing processes of other people is really important. And encouraging men to take care of themselves and to heal themselves. Because we have the outlet of crying, because we're emotional, right, as women. We have the outlet that, you know, people don't expect us to be strong and stoic and hold down everything. And, you know, we're supposed to be sensitive, we're the nurturers. But men are not allowed to do that, right? So what happens when you're a hypersensitive man? and you can't express that. You become the brute. You become the abuser. But if we encourage men to tap into who they really are, and we don't shame them, you know, we're doing them, we're doing ourselves a service, really, because it's about being as human as we possibly can, and we have to keep that in mind. So I say, organize, organize, organize in whatever way possible. I work now for, I want to say this, because, you know, I'm not in the media the way that I used to be. I was in the media 24-7. I'm not in the media 24-7 anymore. I couldn't do it anymore, right? I was getting old. I needed a 403B. 
um, I needed a consistent salary. So I took a job at a Medicaid managed care health plan. But all of the things that I learned throughout all those years of organizing and all those years of healing circles, I'm now utilizing in the place that I work. And so I really struggled to create participatory democracy in a hierarchy. Mm -hmm. That's what that's what I have to do, right? I'm not in a social movement right now, but I have all these ideas, and so I talk about popular education. I make sure that when we do educational work, we do it in utilizing popular education. That we don't continue to use the banking method of education. You're an empty vessel, and the experts are going to fill you up, right? So popular education says, you have all these survival skills, you have all these strategies, you have all this knowledge. If you came from another country, you cross five borders, you've got survival skills up the yin yang. Let's work with those survival skills. Let's translate those into another arena. So never underestimate you know, what people bring to the table. Because what they bring to the table is a resilience that many of us would never, ever be able to match. Um, so you want to look for that kind of thing. I mean, it's about uh, manifesting, I guess, manifesting your humanity in every single possible way with whoever you can. Okay, good. All right, no more questions? Thank you very much. Thank you.